Okay, so welcome to the first talk. Um, Peter Kofler, the code cop, and me, Harald Reinkuber, we will talk about writing tests with the Unity test framework. Maybe uh, not so typical um, talk for 3D uh, development, but um, yeah, I hope, I, I think it's still very interesting. So a, a small introduction about myself. I'm working in the visual computing industry for um, more or less, uh, or quite exactly 10 years. Um, I have already, I, I started in getting interested in testing because in my first job, I had the exper experience of ha having the benefits from having tests. And I missed that quite a lot in the other jobs I had. Um, and this curiosity basically never stops. And but also an experiment I made at this company was that having bad tests is better than no tests. So that should make it easy for starting working on tests. And recently I also started um, experimenting with mob programming. Um, if you want to find out more about mob programming, you can join the other meetup uh, I started running a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, now I will give it over to Peter. Thank you, Harald. So I'm Peter, I'm uh, the code cop. So you see this uh, funny logo here. I have no idea of 3D or anything. That that's the reason I kept asking this weird question. So what's AR, what's VR, I have no idea. So uh, have patience with me. I'm uh, just a regular developer used to be, and I was working in a team and I kind of stumbled upon continuous integration. And my boss said, I will not do that. So I didn't listen to him. I put uh, some product on my machine and my machine started sending emails to everybody who broke the build. I don't know, maybe you know this uh, kind of emails in larger projects, you often have uh, continuous integration servers. And they hated it a lot. So uh, after a year for my birthday, they gave me a t-shirt that said hardcore code cop. So that's uh, kind of like I'm the code cop. I'm a, um, independent. Uh, I'm always struggling to explain myself. Code cops, I'm working with clients to improve quality and productivity. It's about testing. It's about clean code. It's about design. It's, uh, it's basically about learning a lot. Uh, and uh, to that, I'm also part of the Softwerks Kammer. Uh, Wien. So Softwerks Kammer is the German uh, branch of the software crafters uh, movement. So like it's, uh, it's a, how can we explain software crafting? Um, so it's, it's not engineering, it's we have to practice it, we have to move forward, like improve, keep learning, uh, push the boundaries. So that's maybe the ideas of craft crafters. I'm not saying craftsmanship because it's only one gender. So it's a craftership or whatever the uh, right term is. So it's about raising the bar and there is a Vienna group. And it's also having kind of meetups, but usually they are coding dojos. So it's like doing some coding, uh, even in Unity if you like, and um, try to learn from it. So it's more practice based. And actually we started trying that on, on coded reads, right Harald? So the, the ideas we were, um, explaining late, they started in a coding dojo session where we just were sitting together and how could we do that? Right? So, that's, so that's me, I'm, I'm having a strong testing background and, and programming languages and enterprise crap. Don't go for the enterprise crap, stay in your 3D world. Uh, yeah, okay, all right, uh, next uh, slide please. So today's agenda is uh, we have like kind of tried to group it so why would we write tests? I don't know, maybe you, now we'll talk about it in a second. So that's something we might wanna talk about. Is it even possible in 3D? Then uh, maybe explain the Unity test framework. Um, not sure if everybody has used that. And then we have the main part of the talks so like situations we faced when we tried to do the testing on, on a sample application. And then maybe in the end, some ideas how you could get started with your own stuff, right? 
and then we can have questions uh, depending on the time we have uh, in the end. Okay. So let's uh, start maybe with a kind of there is this raise hand or something. So who knows uh, what the test is? So can you can you give me some uh, some uh, Gottfried was raising his hand. So you can use the raise hand. Uh, so I can see it uh, in all participants. Maybe. Now come on, nobody knows uh, what the test is. So you have never written a test. It can't be. It can't be. Right. I, I don't believe you. Just need to find the hand. Ah, you are making fun of me. So maybe there are some of you who write uh, tests for your business logic, right? So Bruno, have you written some tests for, for some business logic not related to? Yeah, probably. And I would say most of you have, even if you don't like to press uh, the button, then maybe some, is there anybody who has used TDD, like test driven development? That's something we, ah, Bruno is using that, cool. Gottfried uh, partially, yeah, nice. Patrick, ever tried uh, test driven development? Yeah, okay. So um, not seeing anything from the other participants, but I guess uh, some of you uh, tried it. So now like, let's step it up. Uh, are you also testing the user, like the UI aspects? Is anybody using the UI aspects, maybe of your games or your 3D things, Gottfried? How about that? Ah, Martin says he's actually uh, testing the UI aspects, yeah. Gottfried, that's, the, no, that's the hard part. <laughs> no thumb up, Gottfried? Okay. Uh, and then maybe is there... Uh, Okay, so Patrick doesn't find the Aris, but no, no, no problem because I'm I can see your face, so uh, it's good. Anybody here who is writing automated tests for all the things, maybe that would be most awesome. And then we can uh, turn like uh, exchange. So Bruno, you writing automated tests for all the things? Oh, the, oh, that sounds interesting. So maybe you can even uh, give us some input in the end because we did not manage to write automated tests. Uh, uh, it's the pyramid, <laughs> right? Pardon? It's the pyramid. Like you write like few end-to-end -end tests because of course they get flaky yeah, and slow. Awesome. And then you, uh, go... you, you, you really want to take my place here. I see. No, I, I, like I don't know at all. I also questions. don't know you. Nah, yeah, even... Yes, yes. I wouldn't even know how to test this in Unity. So please, oh, yes. I'm, I'm thinking on my own use case. <laughs> no. Making fun. Um, so Patrick, why is all these things a vintage meme? Maybe I'm too old. Uh, is there a new all these things meme? So that's, that's now you make me really curious. Uh, I mean, because it's old, right? So, uh, so it should be something with a face mask, I guess, right? So it's uh, like, it's 2020. <laughs> No. Uh, okay, so we see like there's a, we have a different uh, group of participants. Some people are more like basic tests, like most people do. Uh, and um, maybe some people are up to the game and really try to test a lot. So we can, we have a uh, staff for all of you. Okay, Harald, let's uh, see the next slide, please. So why would we write tests even? The next. So there are uh, different reasons why we could write um, automated tests. I'm talking about automated tests because probably everybody is testing the app with some uh, clicking through it or something. Uh, usually, tests are about getting feedback and managing risks. Right. So I want to know if it works, and then uh, I need to keep it working. Basically, that's the risk part. If something stops working, we might have a problem. So like in your apps, uh, Gottfried, if, if I guess there are some parts, if they stop working, they will be very angry with you. But then maybe there are other parts, if, then, if they're not really working, nobody notices for, for a few days. So, so that's the risk. Right? So the things that need to work definitely need automated tests. The other things maybe uh, can live without that maybe so I'm, I'm not saying we're not testing it maybe um, 
Also, if I have the automated tests, I can scale it. Right? I can have thousands of them. I can have them on other devices. I can run them on, on like simulations on all of your target devices, especially for mobile. That's crazy, right? There are so many devices like Samsung Fridge, or I don't know what's out there. So are you sure your stuff runs on a fridge, Gottfried? Because there is a Samsung fridge. So I know. So, and then uh, it also has the tablet. OK. Um, so that's an option, right? If I already have the tests, I can I can run them everywhere on, on the uh, there are like services that allow you to scale on other devices that you don't even own. And I can run them all the time. That's basically what I do. I want to know if it works. I want to know if it works. I want to know if it works every minute, every second when I broke it. I want to know it immediately. So that's the feedback part. So that's good reasons to have automated tests in general. OK. Any criticism here or like uh, comments? And that's what I think, Bruno, you mentioned that we also have a difference in uh, what kind of tests we have, right? So we could write uh, basic unit tests that, that I guess most people uh, said they do with the, the, the core business logic, some calculations, some, some easy things like uh, we can have uh, the unit tests, then we have service tests, and on the top we have the UI tests. This is a, a chart I stole from Martin Fowler, like, uh, so it's a more modern uh, a drawing. So I guess so Patrick will be happy with that. Uh, sorry, I'm making fun of you. Uh, and it means uh, the unit tests are run fast. That's the reason they have this rabbit there. And the user interface, the UI tests are usually slow. We'll, we'll come back to that several times. But they provide more safety based on risk because you're interested if the whole thing works. You're not interested if the unit works. So the unit is covering less risk, but it's fast and it's giving you the feedback much better. So we have some balance here. And as, as Bruno mentioned before, we want to have a few UI tests and we want to have many unit tests in general for a general application, probably web application. So I would say most statistics and these things, they are taken from what is nowadays typical coding, which is web applications. Um, yeah, I said that. Uh, I said that. And also, like if we do test driven development, I will uh, talk in a second. The UI tests are not really helping us. Okay, Harald, please. So, so I was talking why we would like to write tests. Uh, sorry, why we would like to write automated tests because there is a cost, but also there is a benefit. Harald calls it uh, return on invest. I'm not as good with the business terms. Uh, but it's true, right? So you get a return on what you created. Then maybe we have different kinds of tests. Uh, that's a different things. And the third thing I want to mention is we could even write the tests first. And this brings us in the in the area of test driven development. Some of you uh, raise the hand that you do some test driven development. That's awesome. I like that. Um, so I just will mention briefly test driven development means you are well, it means a lot of things, but one of the things is you are writing your test before your production code. Okay, um, so that your code is already you are the first user of your code. Like how I uh, wrote it, uh, the production code interface is used from the viewpoint of the calling code. You are not creating it and then testing it. You are envisioning the usage and then you are uh, running this usage and then it has to do what you want to do, which has a lot of benefits. And we have tests for everything, obviously, right? Because we are writing the tests first. But it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, let's leave it like that. So it's not easy. And uh, often we are struggling, and the code is not aligned with doing TDD and so on. OK, all right, please. So probably everybody has seen that. As a code cop, I had to put it here for completeness. TDD, we write a failing test, we write the test first, we make it pass, and then we clean it up. Okay. So now uh, things get interesting, right? Because uh, we are going in the direction of user interfaces, 
Now the 3D is not clearly a user interface like, like buttons, but it is kind of, at least for me, in the direction of graphics user interfaces. It's, so it has some display things, but it also has some interaction. So user interfaces on themselves are already problematic. Uh, and there are the words used fiddling and massaging. So you have to change the style sheet 50 times before the pixels are like you want them. That's not something you can test. And you can definitely, well, you can, but you can't test it up front. So you cannot write a test up front for that. You can create a test afterwards. Some people take screenshots, but I would say um, most people in the, in the uh, TDD community that I know, also international, would say we are not writing tests for certain things. It would be exact coordinates, colors, uh, maybe hard-coded text even. There is a little benefit in writing a test that something is red. It's probably complicated to do so, like it's hard from the technical perspective. And the, the risk that you are worth is like not big. So you have no return on investment. So these are usually the things we are not testing in TDD. Also like maybe, it's different if it's a warning dialogue, right? If it's a warning dialogue, I might want to test that it's red because it has a different meaning. It, it needs to like stand out, or at least I'm testing that its style is warning and then warning style will be red. But in general, the styles, the colors, we wouldn't test. This might be different for games. It's like, as I said, I'm coming from the classic enterprise stuff. Uh, and this might be different for games. I've heard that games also use like pixel perfect screenshots to make sure that the game is as it's supposed to be in every pixel, which is a lot of work, maybe. Okay, so in general, we are avoiding to test it because the return on invest is not good. So we are not doing that, okay? And if we take this further, like what about the 3D? What about the Unity stuff? Can we even do that, right? Can we write a test to express if something is moving forward? And then how do we express it moved forward? And, and then where is it in the scene? And is it possible? Like we don't, we didn't know. And also, but still as a code cop and also Harald who said he already likes to have tests, which are, uh, is a very nice uh, Harald. So I like you for that. Uh, so can we do that? Can we try that? Can we do DDD maybe even? Like, can we create a test up front? Is that possible? And we tried to do that. I, I looked it up. So how I did was like 30 hours that we, we spent uh, pair coding a remote. So it's like a lot of time basically for a little exercise. Yeah, more and, or less. Yeah. So it's almost one one work week. Uh, if we would include like meetings and stuff, it's one work week. So it's uh, um, it's a lot. Well, lockdown, right? What else should you do? So, <laughs> no. And and we want to share some of the things that happened. So this is kind of raw. It's experimental, I would say. Some things worked. Some things didn't work. Um, yeah. We'll see. Yes, uh, uh, both of us. So like we were pairing on everything because the question was uh, 30 hours for, for each of us. Yes, we were pairing on everything because pair programming is another uh, extreme programming principle. So everything was paired. And also we tried to use DDD as much as possible. Also extreme programming principle. So yes, so basically for your boss, it's like 60 hours. So it's even two weeks, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, and now Harald will uh, explain a bit the test framework. Yeah, so framework everywhere. Um, yeah, if you, it's always good to have a framework, then you feel more comfortable. And yeah, it's I was always um, I was using Unity in my previous company, and um, I wasn't able to motivate the, the team to, to start writing tests. But now I had the 
um, possibility to team up with P Peter and explore it together with him. So, so how does the unity test framework work actually? It's usually not on the top uh, position of the unity tutorials. Um, so first thing you have to know is it's based on n unit. It's just very popular in the C sharp.net world. It's very similar to other X unit test frameworks like J unit and what what not. Um, so you probably if you start using the unity test framework, you will have anyhow go to the documentation of any unit. But um, I will show you like the basic things how to use it. <clears throat> the basic any unit test method looks like this. You have like the uh, test annotation. Um, so n unit knows, okay, this method is actually a test. Then usually you have some kind of action going on, and then you assert if the action did what it should do. So yeah, in this example, you are creating an object and then it's asserted that the value of the text property of the message is equal to hello world. And yeah, the nice thing about TDD is if you forget to do the assert, which can happen, um, it would always be green. And with TDD, you would find out because you first have to have a red test, uh, just as a side note. So a basic test is, is really simple in theory. Um, very often you need to have some setup things before. So a typical um, scenario is you have some arrange part where you where we prepare something you want to execute later. Um, then you have the ex actual execution and then you do the assert to check if the result is what you expected. So this is like the AAA of, of, of testing, arrange, act and assert. Um, and this setup things can also be moved to a separate um, setup and tear down method. There are special annotations for that. And the nice thing is that um, it can be, uh, this will be executed now for every method in the class. So if you have multiple test methods in one class, the init is run all the time maybe you want to clean the database or, or do you have some some preparation step you want to make sure that every every test starts with a clean state then it might be a good idea to have such a setup method and the tear down method if you need to do clean up as well and also there would be a one time setup and a one time tear down uh, yeah don't I guess you imagine. So this, this is then run only once for the whole test execution. And then if your test works, you will have the check marks and you can celebrate that your code is working, at least the, what you are testing, uh, which, is, which might be something else, but you have some additional confidence that what you did um, is working and you can execute these tests as well in the future. Um, yeah. And then, so what is actually the unity test framework doing? It comes, um, yeah, first of all, you have to install it via the unity package manager. Um, it has a unity, the unity test framework differentiates between play mode tests um, so these play mode tests also allows you to load scenes and assert the runtime behavior. So you, you can interact with your th scenes um, during, uh, in, within the test. And you can even build test builds. 
which then run on um, your mobile platform, on your game console, or even in the WebAssembly browser. Um, where, yeah, because um, the, your code might behave different when it is running on a mobile device, for example. Um, yeah, so here's the link also to the uh, package. That is, that is because of the cross compiling? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And you sometimes might have some if on Android you have to do that. And also you depend on, on some things from the native platform. So um, if you if your other platforms are really important, then it's also necessary to run the tests there um, or have special platform dependent tests to test certain things. So what is the difference uh, between those edit mode and play mode tests? Um, so the play mode tests, they can run standalone in a player or inside the editor. And the editor tests, they only run in the Unity editor. And they also have access to the editor code. So usually you use the edit mode tests um, for testing your editor extensions. So if, if you don't develop any editor extensions or some Unity um, developer plugins, um, probably the play mode tests are the ones which are the most interesting. Hello. So, can yeah. you can you answer the comment from Patrick in the chat? Patrick wrote, uh, "And Unit only works on Windows. Unity tests uh, framework works on all platforms. So how is that?" Um, well, it comes prepackaged with the um, with uh, so you you download the Unity test framework. Uh, you, you integrate the package of the Unity test framework. Uh, so I assume um, it should work everywhere where you uh, where you can run unity so yeah, also I, I mm -hmm. it's just based on it right it's not using an unit it's kind of modified and unit at least it seemed like that right yeah and i mean now with dotnet core i assume everywhere where dotnet core is running um, it should should work as well i haven't tested it on on the macbook or on linux though so but I, I, in the documentation, there were no um, comments that it is only working on Windows. Yeah, and we are not on uh, .NET Core yet, uh, as Bruno posted. So Patrick, do you have more uh, infos on on that uh, issue? I think it's, it's as Harald said, it's like pre-packaged, so you wouldn't even notice, but it has the same annotations and the same methods as NUnit has. Yeah, so it's it's maybe it's not about end unit runner or anything. It's all like the Unity runner, Unity test runner. It's just the test how you write it. So maybe that's the confusion because I don't know about the infrastructure. The test how you write it is like end unit test. So you mm. it looks the same. Uh, it has this assertions. It has more assertions, I guess, right? It it has the same annotations. So I would say it is an end unit test, but then maybe it is not uh, because of uh, how it's how it's run. Uh, yeah, I don't know if if end unit is already like ready to be run in mono. Uh, uh, I think I had it in uh, .NET Core in some package, but well, I don't know. I can't remember. Maybe it wasn't .NET Core. So, so it's not. But you're not using end unit. It just is. It looks like end unit. So, um, and like we were looking for the skip, and the skip was the end unit. Uh, so we found it right. I think that was. All right. yeah. yeah, so uh, it, the end unit comes with the Unity test framework. Um, I did not try switching it with a different version, so I don't know how 
if that's possible. Um, or if they modified the end unit, um, I cannot tell you about that. And the die, yeah, what's happening under the hood? May, um, maybe they use a different um, test runner, or they just extend the end unit test runner. Maybe they cross compile the intermediate code of of end unit to to the other platforms. But it, uh, you can assume that it works. Um, yeah. So when we when we did our experiments, what we find found out is that it's still important to differentiate. Um, so you have display mode tests where you can access everything. You can load scenes and so on. So, but we still had the felt the necessity to differentiate between full-fledged unity tests and unit tests. So, um, I mean, it's basically the differentiation between a unit test and the integration test. So if you load the whole unity scene or, or a specific test scene for your test, then it's more of an integration test. Um, and if you use the only the n unit test attribute, um, then it's more it's more likely um, just a unit test. But the, the definition is not that clear. I guess what it's important is that if you don't need to access any unity specific stuff and you can do your test just, accessing your, your business logic code without any Unity specific things from the Unity engine, then it's even better to do so. Your test will be fast. And yeah, because once you start loading a scene, um, it will take more time. Um, but of course, um, often you will have to do that to, to test some interactions in your scene. So, and you definitely have to do that if you want to skip a frame, if the logic you're testing depends on some runtime behavior. Um, and yeah, what's also good to know is that if, if the tests with the Unity test attribute, they run in a coroutine. Um, so you can call other coroutines from that test and wait for the coroutine to finish, which is, which is important if you want to simulate this, uh, an interaction for a couple of seconds or milliseconds. So here are a couple of test scenarios we, we, we faced. Yeah, I kind of already mentioned, um, if possible or as much as possible, avoid slow integration tests. Um, yeah, Peter already mentioned the test pyramid. Um, it's also important to have integration tests, uh, which tests more than a single unit or one functionality, because you also want to know if everything works well together. Um, but it's also tempting to um, only or mostly do integration tests because it's maybe a little bit more obvious how to test things in a, on an integration level. Um, and also the higher confidence um, might be tempting to, then you know that everything works together but they are really hard to maintain. Um, if they fail, it doesn't point you to the, to the actual code, um, which has the problem. So it can be tedious. Um, you see why it's failing, but the root cause, it can take hours or days finding the root cause. So it's good to have also unit tests. And uh, when we started in the beginning, it was often difficult to say, up front, um, can we make a unit test for that? So we often started with an integration test, 
And then while when we did the integration tests, we developed more ideas how to turn this into a unit test. So that would be one, one pattern. If you don't know if a unit test is possible, start with an integration test, but take the time afterwards to think about, can I remove all the unity dependencies and make it a unit test which runs fast and doesn't load the scene and so on. For scene loading, uh, we we used uh, Sendject. It's, it's a dependency injection framework. Um, it's it's uh, quite a good um, Unity asset. Um, it's also public on GitHub. And uh, depend, the Sendject framework offers a scene test fixture. Um, the nice thing is um, it provides a core routine for loading uh, a scene and you can just yield the core routine and then focus on your actual test. Um, you could probably easily develop uh, such uh, methods on your own as well, but it comes for free with, from Sandjack. And if you're anyhow are interested in using a dependency injection framework, um, it might be a good idea to use this as well. So um, when we tested our, when we, when we executed our first test, we realized, yeah, okay, they take a couple of seconds, which is okay if, if, it, if you just have a few of them, but over time you might develop hundreds of tests and then it really makes a difference. If you run your tests after every little change, or once per commit or once per day or once per week, um, you immediately use some of the, or many of the benefits of your tests. So it's a good idea to keep the tests fast. And one nice thing uh, you can do with Unity is you can change the time scale. So if you have like a simulation, which takes five seconds or three seconds, you can make the test run uh, 10 times faster by um, increasing the, the virtual time, um, time factor. At least if, if your test is not slow because of some comput computation that has to uh, be processed. So if it's only the the game simulation, which takes that long, you can fake a faster time. But um, this is not always a solution. So I think um, it's still necessary to make sure that you are not executing things in your tests, um, which you don't need actually. So. Um, if, if the loading of your scene takes a long time, it might be good to have a smaller test scene to load fewer assets or maybe strip down 3D models so that your tests are still running fast. Um, it, you maybe want to load the whole scene in your end-to-end -end tests and in the integration tests and smaller tests it should be as fast as possible. And one thing we we were thinking about, uh, but we didn't um, run more experiments on that. Um, at least it was a question I had. What if I set the time scale to almost infinity? Um, I would, or um, it might be that things behave different then. So but maybe not. Um, so maybe you can increase the time, uh, the, the time scale quite a lot. Um, if, if you are not sure if there could be an issue, it might be a good idea to have a nightly build where you, where you configure it to real time scale. I think Harald, we had one issue that when we made it too fast, 
we couldn't observe the effect uh, at the at the moment we wanted to observe it or something like that, right? Because we had some moving object, mm -hmm. and we waited some seconds for it to actually move, mm -hmm. and then of we made the time faster, so it moved faster. And when it was too fast, and we couldn't like observe it in the in the moment when we wanted to assert it, right? Was I think it was that we had such a situation, right? Mm -hmm. so it can happen, as you say, right? Yeah, it could be, and. Um... So what you definitely, so if you have a test which fails, uh, like a, a, a false negative, um, then it's okay. But if, if your tests are working because you, you tweak the time, but in reality it should fail, then, then it's bad probably. So it might be good to have it configurable to check also if, if it's related to this. Yeah, also we, we developed um, um, uh, many helpers for, for the, especially for the coroutines. So yeah, it's really good if you try to keep the actual test method really small, clean and readable. And one idea, for example, is like for the scene loading, we have a uh, given scene static method, which um, does the scene loading. And um, I think we also added some basic checks there. And then you immediately start with what you actually want to test. So the smaller um, your test method is, the easier it is to figure out what's, what, was, what the test is about for somebody who has to maintain it. And it can be even you after one or two years, um, if you never touch the test method again and suddenly it fails, um, it might be hard to remember what you was, were thinking back then. So especially coroutines, they are a little bit more verbose, um, but also other things, it's a good idea to have uh, some helper functions for that. And what was also interesting is um, input testing. So the, the new Unity input system allows to simulate um, user interaction. So you can add your input devices from the test and then simulate button clicks, or for example, set the gamepad stick to a certain value. So the user interaction might be a really important th thing of your application. So it's also good to have tests there. And just remember when you feel like you sh should simulate user input or you want to simulate user input, check out the uh, input system documentation. There is at least a small section about how, how to do that in your test. And also a typical challenge in, in when testing computer graphics or, or, or image processing things is that you often do deal with decimal numbers. And decimal number, numbers can often vary a little bit um, because of in, in like very um, far from the comma. Um, and it might make your test fail because it's just one small increment different than the value you are testing with. And that's why um, the Unity test framework offers this float equality comparer where you can define what's the smallest error, which is still allowed. And you then in your assert, um, you can then tell it, it should use this float equality comparer um, and then you will be, you don't have um, 
false positive filling filling tests um, because of the small float value difference. You can do the same thing also with vectors. So you have a um, vector free equality comparer. The same exists for a vector two or a vector four as well. And you also provide it what's the smallest error you, um, <clears throat> which should the test still make pass. And what might be also interesting um, is to use parameterized tests. So you can annotate the parameters of your test function um, with the values annotation. This is basically uh, an, an unit annotation um, to run your tests with, with different parameters, which might be interesting if you, yeah, um, certain running certain tests with just one value doesn't give you con confidence. So usually you would want to know if it works with all the values, but all the values is hard to test and you would need infinite amount of computing time. But if you at least increase it a little bit um, to have one small value, one really high value and one normal value, um, then you have a bigger confidence that your test is actually telling you when something goes wrong. Um, yeah, one, one important thing Peter pointed out uh, was you shouldn't misuse the parameterized tests for <laughs> testing too many things at the same time. So it might be tempting to, if you test your, your game character um, and, and have parameters for all the different configurations of your game character, um, you should still try to focus on testing one requirement at the same time. Um, so even if you can do that with a parameterized test, um, it might still be a good idea to have it in separate tests to focus on one thing at a time. So it's also a little bit of a balance of the test expressiveness and the code reuse. Um, yeah, so only test in one dimension. Okay, and so that was a a bunch of different things that that we tried and did and uh, came up for testing and so we tested a lot I would say we we did a lot of TDD or at least acceptance uh, test driven development because uh, the unity tests are not TDD tests they are more like uh, integrated tests or so acceptance test driven development we had a lot of tests uh, still there were things that we had bugs right um, because we were focusing, uh, for example, on the dynamic aspect. So we had something that was moving uh, and we were focusing that it was actually moving. So we were comparing coordinates and yes, it is moving in the speed we wanted to move, that worked. But then we looked at it, uh, it was below the floor. So we didn't see it. Uh, so it moved correctly, but it was below the floor. It's not a big deal, right? It was a constant coordinate that we didn't uh, check and we didn't set it correctly when set up. And we didn't add a test for that. Right? So I would, uh, to conclude, it's a similar to this um, uh, coordinates and colors. So things that are not interesting, I might not create a test for it because it's still uh, like a lot of work. Maybe not a lot, but it's some work. Even with uh, the Unity testing framework allows a lot of things to, uh, you just check it, you just get the color and that's it. So it's uh, pretty easy. Um, but some things uh, we didn't test and then we had a bug basically. So I would say, even if you do full amount of testing, uh, you need to run the application from time to time. Now, if this would be business logic only, it might be different, but with the UI and the aspects we said, we don't wanna test, it has no uh, high return on investment. 
we, see, we need to see it, right? I need to see if the distances are good, if the colors are, are nice and uh, something. No machine can can check that. So we need we need to see that. Okay. So last section. I hope you're extremely excited now to use this in in your uh, projects uh, that I already have uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of uh, Unity code. So how could we do that? And we have, yes, please, next slide. So there are different aspects here. The first thing is, how can we uh, bring that into an existing project? And this is hard, right? I even wrote here the word excruciating. Yes, because it has a lot of things you need to overcome. You need to talk to people. You need to like make them want to test. You uh, maybe have to change the code a lot. Code that was written by other people that is not testable, that was not written with TDD. It might not be testable in a, in a classic sense. So the design is not allowing it to be testable other than by the UI. And if you have only UI tests, I remember the test pyramid, you won't be happy. Uh, because they are not as stable. Uh, you might need to write a lot of test infrastructure for your first tests. So we were spending a lot of uh, extracting these coroutines that we created. So we had a few tests and then we kept like 10 hours refactoring and creating abstractions for our test infrastructure. Uh, because you have nothing. When you start, you have nothing. And you will need your own test infrastructure following a bit your abstractions. Maybe you have some uh, some core functionality and then you will have test functionality for this core functionality and you will reuse this test functionality. Like uh, Gottfried, you said, if you're, if you're identifying certain objects, you will have test code to prepare certain objects to be identified and then you will keep reusing that, for example. So we will need to build test infrastructure, build pipeline, everything. If you don't have that, it's a lot of work and you don't, see any benefit immediately. So expect it to be hard. It's just like it is. If I tell you it's easy, it's super cool, it's all pink, it's not true. It has a lot of benefit, but it is hard. And it has like right some, some ramp up time. So uh, maybe the best is to start in a time boxed way. So you're not getting frustrated or just losing all the time there. So if you want to start uh, adding tests to your project, do it in a time boxed way. Maybe like do every Friday afternoon. Okay, that's uh, that's uh, some projects have this uh, Friday afternoon free time or where you can do some research or maybe some study or look at some new stuff uh, from the newest unity or something like that. You can also use it to have a look at how to write tests for some things. Okay, so clear recommendation, don't go in because it will be frustrating, start slow. Okay, next slide, please. So another problem is the team, right? So you will need to convince the team because you can, uh, like you can encapsulate the others and have your fences of everything is tested, but you're not living on your own. There are other people adding to your code or you have to work with what they create. Uh, it's like you're in a team. So also the other people have to kind of support this, right? So you probably need to um, make your colleagues also agree to that. And that is uh, need some kind of polite discussions. So if you say people, we start testing because it's cool and the code cop said we should do it, then probably they won't do it, right? And also your manager will say no. Uh, so we need uh, some some benefit discussions, some return on invest discussions. Uh, usually, all people agree that if something is complex, a lot of conditions inside, it needs testing. So that is maybe an argument you can use if you get some code in the pull request and it has like 100 ifs. Where are the tests? Right? This is crazy code. I can't understand it. It needs to have some tests. So that could be an argument. Uh, you could also argue like code that is really important, like we talked earlier, uh, Gottfried, in your example, like really risky code needs have tests. It, it just needs to have tests, right? If it's broken, uh, we might even go bankrupt or lose some money or lose a client. We can't have that. So that's then you're arguing with return on invest. Right? And there are always trade-offs. And 
okay, I'm the code cop, I like dogma, I think dogma is good, but in this discussion, avoid dogma. So it's, it's not helping. Uh, even in the core, we know we should be professional and professional work needs automated tests, but with other people, there is some uh, kind of let them glide into it. And that also needs, we have to improve our own skills. So if you start doing it, uh, probably you're doing it wrong. Right? If, when, when you remember how you rode the bike the first time, probably you fell, right? So it's very unlikely that you rode a bike and the first time and you didn't fall. So expect that you make mistakes. That's, that's okay. Like it's learning, you will fall. And well, you could get some coaching, of course. Uh, you could, uh, if you have some budget, you could also go to some events like coding dojos or code retreats or the assembler programming or more programming that Harald is doing, like go to some uh, community things where tests are written. Because you, you write tests for your for your stuff, Harald, don't you? I'm kidding. Yeah, so of, of course yeah. you do, like for your, uh -huh. for your uh, uh, online open source uh, coding. Depends on the project. Uh, uh -huh. We're working on open source projects and some don't have tests. But if, if there are tests, of course, we write as well. So uh, you should find proper open source projects. No, I'm making fun. So uh, all these events are uh, often containing uh, extreme programming um, principles. So we want to pair or in, a, in an ensemble, so a mob, and we need to have tests. We want to do TDD. So it's also, if you can't do it, you will fail and expect to fail. You're doing it the first time. And this is hard. This is not just the hello world sample. This is, this is, uh, as I showed in the beginning, it's the end of the evolution, core logic, integrated user interface, 3D. So we need to dig in uh, a bit. Okay, next slide, please. So maybe for all the people who already knew that, my recommendation where to start actually in the code. So you have different, um, let's say, uh, approaches to that because you can't just start writing tests that will never be done and it's not adding any value. So you have different, um, as I said, approaches to do that. So you could, for example, create a test for every bug. Right? Eventually you will have a group of tests for the things that go wrong. So that things that actually were wrong once. So they have proven their, their return on invest already. And if, if you keep to that, you will, create a suite of tests and you will have some tests after some time and it won't cost you a lot because you're doing it incrementally like in tiny steps all of this is tiny steps okay another way or maybe additionally look at new stuff if you do new stuff and it's kind of outside of the core maybe do it tdd do a heavy testing on that make it really uh full of tests it's also good for the learning right and then at least the new stuff is, is good, it's solid. We can rely on it. So solid in, 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 in unbreakable, it's not necessarily solid from this side. Just don't add tests wherever. Like it's not, it's not helping. Uh, it's not helping anybody. Uh, if you add a test for some feature that is never changed, it, there is no return on invest. And I would do that if I'm like on 90% test coverage for the, for the achievement, like if I'm if I'm if it's the, the last thing I'm missing for 100% test coverage, I might test some old code as well. But you're never there, so uh, keep keep it real. Uh, two areas that might be candidates where you start adding tests. Again, business risk. Right? If uh, you want to uh, mitigate business risk, so this could be an area which is not changed. Still, we are adding tests to it because uh, we want to make sure in the future this is not breaking. Uh, that could even be, uh, and I had to have, have uh, seen that at clients. This could be communicated with the product owner. It's about business. It's about value. It's about risk. And then they might schedule some time. They will tell you which area this is usually because the, the, the business people know what is a business risk. And then you can, can spend some time on this area to like harden it or, or add some automated tests because the business people don't want regressions. Uh, so 
And from the developer perspective, it's uh, really good to have them on the place that is often changed because then you get the benefit. So if you have tests for some area that is changed a lot, you will probably break it a lot because it's keep changing, keep changing, so you keep breaking it. And if you have tests there, it's helping yourself. So you're not uh, having any regressions and not losing your face or like looking stupid because it's not working again. That could be another area. So either it works for you, benefit for you, or a risk for the business. And I would say that's the main uh, things. And when you start learning, you could test what is easy to test just for the starting. So it might not give you a return on invest, but it's if it's easy to test, it's it's like a learning aspect and you already have some tests, so it feels good. So it re it's reasonable. So I would say that's the like the three areas. Don't try to go for stuff that is hard to test and never used. So that that's not helping. So that's just for the trash bin. Uh, okay. I think that's it, yes. So to sum this up, we are in the end of the talk here. Automated tests are cool, obviously, and maybe uh, you got this idea that uh, Harald and uh, I, we are both uh, lo loving automated tests, so they are awesome. And they are a tool for a lot of things, for feedback, uh, for risk, if you communicate with business people. Um, just pays off, you need to have them, there's no discussion. It is possible, so we would, uh, I think we succeeded in like most things we wanted to test, right, all right? So yeah. I think there was only this one thing with the button click or something that kind of we couldn't make work, but it's rather a shortcoming on our side because it should work. So we then we stopped the investing time in that. So it's possible, as some, some stuff is even easy, so some stuff was really easy when you have the infrastructure ready, another test, no big deal, right? Uh, on the other hand, not everything can be tested or not, must be tested. It's also like your decision, what's, what's, what's reasonable. And as I said, when you start that, uh, it's hard and you won't have the benefit. So you need to get started. And then after some time, you can evaluate the benefits. So it's a kind of, you have to trust me or trust Harald or trust the Unity company that when they bring you a testing framework that it has some benefit. And after some time, when you know how to write the test, when you have all the tools, the infrastructure, you will see the benefit. Okay. Now it's completely silent, but it's silent anyway, because it's a uh, remote. So it's a, uh, uh, that's a bit annoying if it's silent. Okay, that's it. So now would be the time uh, I see claps in the chat. That's nice. Uh, thank you for the claps. So now is the time for questions. First of all, thank you, Peter and Harald for this awesome talk. Um, um, as I saw in the slides, you know Uncle Bob, Peter. <laughs> yeah, so, not personally, but yeah. No, no, but you know him. And I think uh, that's one guy you should know if you do TDD or at least do some testing. He has some awesome YouTube videos and I recommend all, all to my newbie colleagues to at least see one of his videos uh, because he also very well explains um, what what's the benefit of, of testing. And I think you might uh, be very nice. Entertaining, right? It's super entertaining. Yeah. 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 Well, super he wrote fun. the clean code book, right? So even exactly. if you don't like him personally, because some people don't yeah. like him personally, the book is great. Uh, it's easy to read. So if you don't know it, I recommend reading it. It's like only 400 pages. I'm not reading any books more than 400 pages because I'm <laughs> unable to do that. So, so yes, if you have new colleagues, maybe buy it from the company and just give it to them and it uh, can, can read it. Uh, but the examples are in Java, so maybe that's a bit uh, putting off juniors. Not yeah, seeing... but uh, yes, but like he has, he explains this like um, yeah. mountain range coding and stuff like that. So it's it's really awesome also to understand how to make code clean and readable. He has a super talk about that because um, yeah, when I stumbled about code. From also from me like ages ago or or from newbies in the company, and then you see like you said like thousand if statements with with no 
no explanation uh, and maybe just some variables that are like ABC, then you have no fucking clue what the code is doing. Um, yeah, so thanks again for this awesome talk. Uh, questions from the audience? Uh, yes, I would have one. Uh, thank yeah. you very much for investing the time to actually try and find out how the things work. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit a little bit about the things, the tests that you actually did. What did you test in Unity? Um, so I, I am expected you also tested some coordinate frames because you were ma mentioning this um, variability of the floats and things like that. But what were other things that you tested? I'm not quite sure how that, uh, how would you, like what well, we, we, we focused on the behavior. Um, so the other thing we tried is if we can do TDD. And um, so we wrote a lot of tests until to have a really small scene. Um, well, I mean, 30 hours are a lot, but also on the other hand, it's not that much um, if you start something new. Um, so one of the tests, for example, was um, we want to verify that our game character is moving. So we had a test that uh, once we clicked on start, uh, we, we simulated this, uh, we called the start method, and then we wanted to see if it, the position changed. That was one of the tests. And then we also had like, uh, we had the interaction, it was moving, we turned right, and then we checked if it actually turned right and moved yeah. right. Exactly. Uh, cool. So we also had the keyboard interaction there. We we started with constants, like we were checking that like the floor was where we wanted it, uh, just mm -hmm. to get warmed up with the thing. So as I said, it's not valuable, but it's always good for warm up. So even on the UIs, mm -hmm. my first test is, is the feel is the is the label there? Right? It's not yeah. like it's, it doesn't have return and invest, but then you're in it. You already have all the the access and everything. So, yeah. yeah, so we did that. Um, I think we did um, some other stuff. We tested if some new elements were created, right, Harald? Because mm. it was kind of leaving a trail. Yeah. So uh, something was scaling. To, to have like a trail. And then we were checking if after some movements, this was also like a growing. Also with the coordinates again, right? So because its size was growing and, and mm -hmm. coordinates were moving. Um, and then I think we were uh, testing some button click on this uh, 2D UI in the 3D plane. And there we had some technical issues, I would say, right? It's kind of... Mm -hmm couldn't make it work like I'm sure it would work in a way yeah it was like um, we didn't want to test if the button if the unity button works so it's like uh, do you call the method which is called by the button or do you simulate the button click um, verifying that the method is actually called. So this, these are like the, the things where we were, yeah, it's, if it's like the start button, you will need to click it anyhow. So you will immediately, when you test it manually and you also have to test it manually, you will immediately see it. If it is a button, um, which is not always, not that often used, then it might be interesting to think about adding a test there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess one of the next things we would have done would have been to check if the player stops when it when it reaches the wall. Mm -hmm. exactly. Things like or, or dies when uh, when certain threshold is uh, when it falls off or something. Mm -hmm. um, there could also be probably a point where this time scaling uh, gets an issue. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. so the Thank important you. thing is don't test um, that the rendering is correct. Um, mm -hmm. It's You don't want to write the tests that should be in the Unity engine, actually. Mm -hmm. Or in the 
traffic driver. Yeah, I think because in an early experiment, we tried a screenshot, right? So screenshot is another option. You can like do something and then take a screenshot. But as I said, pixel perfect is maybe your requirement, but maybe not. So, and then you have no feedback what is wrong. So we, we stopped doing that, right? Carl, I can remember, I think in the second uh, coding dojo or something, we tried this. Yeah, uh, I think what we did is instead of really taking a screenshot, because you have to update the screenshot every time, uh, we changed the color of the scene. And then we verified that one specific pixel is red. Oh, it's like a screenshot, but only for an area, right? So we were yeah. verifying pixels. Yeah. I mean, it might be an interesting idea in some cases, but um, I think um, if, if you want to have E2E tests, um, uh, to have a few screenshot tests, I guess, for um, if you work in the game industry, I could imagine um, that it might be also a good idea to have a couple of screenshot tests to make sure that you know when something in the rendering quality changes. But you will have to, to you, you need to expect to that you will have to update them a lot. Um, yeah. So a tool like approvals, which is available for C Sharp, can help you there. So it would show, uh, have you heard of that, Martin? No, I haven't heard about it. Uh, so that would show you a diff tool. That if you have a diff tool that supports uh, diffing images, there are a few mm -hmm. diff tools included. So when the test fails, it opens the diff, okay. and then you can decide if the new picture is okay. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, and then you so. say okay, accept, and then the new picture becomes the default. Mm -hmm. And it uh, you still have to decide, but it's supporting you on accepting. That's the reason it's called approval. You are approving something that's sh is shown to you, and and yeah. So that, that, that's a way. Um, does it answer it, your question? It answers my question, yeah. Okay. Thank you. The, the approval tests are a good point. It would be interesting if they work with Unity as well, because sometimes third party libraries or tools, if they are not tested with Unity. Yeah, I they mean, they're not, not, because if they are using something low level from C Sharp, uh, and I think they are like getting the method that called them or something like that, then it's not working. Um, yeah, sometimes if they use something from the .NET framework, which mm -hmm. only works on Windows, then it doesn't work. Um, the, the .NET version of of unity is not yet the newest one um and well, that is that is something for a future talk martin maybe you're volunteering uh to give a like uh because it's a powerful tool also i guess it does not have a renderer for unity it can render certain things uh so it's it's capturing the image itself so also you would have to write this uh, mm -hmm. a, uh, a writer, basically it's called writer in, in the approval world that takes something and writes it to some file. It can be text or, or picture. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's something to explore here. Yeah, um, well, you can call the Unity test framework from an API. So you could even <clears throat> call the Unity engine from the command line and call a certain test method which executes something inside Unity as well. So maybe if, if you cannot use it internally, there could be ways to call it from, out, mm -hmm. from the outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. So I didn't look at the chat. Um, if, if there are more questions, feel free to ask them. Now. I didn't see, but uh, Bruno was quite active on the, ch on the chat. You still have a question, Bruno? No, I wasn't aware of this uh, acceptance, uh, not acceptance, what's the name? The approval snapshot tool. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I didn't know about this. Pretty cool. I'm gonna try it out. Um, I have a question. Um, I, I, I was curious, like, like what Martin was, uh, you wrote the, the Unity, um scene or you, you you set up the scene do, do you have it ready to show or or is it not as a showcase planned and 
Wow, now it's, now it's getting embarrassing, right? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's just a, a block that moves around. I mean, um, we do we do also tests in uh, with n unit and n substitute in in our team because um, for various reasons. <laughs> and one of the most reasons, uh, uh, Peter, you said is like um, you want to know that your code is working, mm. even if you change something. So it's not like um, if I change this uh, if statement or if I put my character on the platform number two, does it still move? And you know it by if, because your tests are, are uh, running right and giving you the correct results. So yeah, um, if it's too embarrassing for you, I don't want to push you there. So it's okay because uh -huh. I know that tests are writing tests is tedious and is hard work as, as Pete, Peter already said. Um, and, and yeah, I, I also would assume like follow your rules starting small because it, it eats hours away, at least if you're not used to, to write tests. Yeah, and also I have no idea about unity, right? So we also took yeah, turns who was typing. Yeah. So, uh, but we, uh, we could do that if we make sure that uh, Bruno has enough time for his talk also. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you have, yeah. Yeah. Do we have any other questions uh, directly related to the talk? Stefan, maybe do you have a question? Not net, uh, not, not yet, perhaps later. When okay, so, so you're good. Um, yeah. So I guess so let's conclude that, yes? Thank you. Thank you, Peter, Thank for you also joining me in, in sharing our findings um, and offering the talk to do together. Um, yeah, let's have a 10 minutes break and then we will continue with the talk by Bruno.